Welcome back. For almost a dozen weeks now, we've been trying to understand various theories about the nature of minds, dualism, behaviorism, eliminativism, identity theory, functionalism, and more. And we've been especially focused on the pros and cons of each theory and on the desiderata that have motivated competing theorists. But it's worth taking a moment to circle back to the question that we asked at the very beginning and that you might have been asking yourself along the way. Who cares? It's tempting to ask this question in a rhetorical or dismissive way, as though it were obvious that nobody cares, or at least nobody ought to care. That would be unfortunate, not least of which because you're stuck in a class where you're going to have to pretend to care for at least a few more weeks. But it's also a mistake because we've already posed the question quite deliberately and provided an answer. I suggested some general reasons to care about inquiry, philosophical and otherwise, that I surveyed in the first week of class. And we can also give some detailed reasons to care about the nature of minds in particular. The reasons that I've emphasized throughout this course are that questions about the nature of minds are closely related to questions about knowledge and responsibility. Theories of knowledge and theories of moral and legal responsibility each make assumptions about the nature of human cognition. I don't mean to imply that there's just one theory of knowledge or one correct theory, nor of legal and moral responsibility. On the contrary, the point is to emphasize that every theory of knowledge and every theory of responsibility makes some assumptions about the kinds of creatures we are, about what kinds of creatures can have knowledge, can be morally responsible, or can be owed moral or legal respect. And those assumptions invariably entail commitments about what kind of psychological traits and capacities are held by knowers, moral subjects, or moral agents. So one important reason to care about the nature of minds is that minds are thoroughly interwoven with other topics that most of us already care about. And our caring about minds for these reasons is connected with the role that minds play in perception and action, and thereby in knowledge and responsibility. So, what is action? What do we mean when we say that minds are important for action? And for example, what do we mean to say when we say that perception is for action? In the article that I'm asking you to read for this week, Zoe Drayson makes a survey of five broad classes of ideas that go under the label perception for action. We might be talking about the evolution of perception as action-oriented, the mechanisms of perception as action-oriented, the content of perception as action-oriented, the phenomenology of perception as action-oriented, or the nature of perception as action-oriented. As Drayson is quick to point out, these alternatives are not exclusive. Someone might argue that perception is action-oriented in one or more of these ways. Ultimately, Drayson argues that the reasons for thinking that the mechanisms of perception are action-oriented are in tension with the reasons for thinking that the content of perception is action-oriented. But we're not going to have time to delve into that in this class. Our goal is just to understand the options. The first idea, that perception evolved in order to enable action, can be understood as trivial. If perceptual systems were produced by natural selection, as in some sense they must have been, then they evolved because they enabled interaction with the world and the environment. But there's also the stronger claim that perception evolved to enable action in a way that contrasts with perception evolving to, for example, enable accurate representation of the world. On this view, for which Drayson cites both Kathleen Aikens and Patricia Churchland, perception's evolution for action is contrasted with its evolution for knowledge. Drayson interprets this view as holding that we have two kinds of perceptual systems, one for action and one for abstract thought. And she thinks there could be some evidence for this, at least in some perceptual systems. At the other end of the list, there's the idea that perception is always essentially connected to action, that to be a perceiver is to be an agent capable of certain actions. If this is right, then it's not just an accident that Descartes' I or Avicenna's flying man have no perceptions. Rather, they're not candidates for perceiving because, lacking bodies, they can't act. On this view, disembodied minds are not capable of perception on principle. This is because the very possibility of genuine perception, as opposed to hallucination or imagination perhaps, the very possibility of genuine perception presupposes the possibility of action and that requires a body. So those disembodied minds are not even candidates for action. 
A somewhat tangential claim, but one that's gotten a lot of attention recently, is that perception is action-oriented because perceptual experience includes certain motivations or urges. Someone might think, for example, that when I see steps in front of me, my perceptual experience already includes an urge to step. Or when I see a coffee cup in front of me, I don't have to combine that perception with a separate desire for coffee because my perception of the thing as a coffee cup already includes the urge to drink coffee from it. Someone who doesn't enjoy coffee on this view would simply see the cup differently as a soon to be trash or a container of yuck or whatever. When I see a can of beets on the grocery store shelf, I immediately and constitutively see it as something to be avoided. Having briefly discussed the first option and then the last two options that Drayson outlines, let's now turn our attention to the second and third. Before you proceed to the next lesson, please read Zoe Drayson's paper, What is Action-Oriented Perception? And watch two short videos, one about Shaky the Robot and one about so-called affordances.